I'm David Clayton, and this is the Way of Beauty podcast, conversations on Catholic faith and culture. Great to have you here. It's um, good to be here. Now, oh. I know that uh, you're a great artist, and we've uh, communicated um, a, a little bit over the years and been aware of what we're doing. But I realized when I contacted you that I don't actually know much about you personally. I know you're up there in Canada, up there relative to where I am, down in California. Um, so perhaps could you just begin by telling us uh, a little bit about your, your story? Are, are you a convert? Were you brought into the, the ch Orthodox Church as a child? Just give us some background. All right. Yeah, sure. I can do that. First of all, I want to thank you for having me on your podcast. Uh, people who are listening to this or watching this might not know, but David is the very first person who ever wrote about my carving. I think this was in like 2011 or 2012. Uh, I, I, was, I was just starting and I, I sent an email to uh, David through a, a new liturgical movement. And uh, he wrote a little article on my, on my carving. And through that little article, I was found by a church designer and uh, different people. And so, he, so David has a big part in actually starting my career as an icon carver. So I, wanted, I always wanted to thank you for that, by the way. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> no, there you go. There you go. That's what it's about. Okay. <laughs> so I, yeah, I am, um, I grew up in an evangelical home and I was always a Christian. My parents were very devout Christians until today, but, uh, in my twenties, I studied, I mean, early twenties, I studied art in university and the whole time I was really struggling with the, uh, let's say the conjunction between my faith um, and contemporary art, but also my faith, my evangelical faith and making visual art in general, all of that was just this big mess in my mind that I was trying to work out to an extent that the subject of my painting was actually that problem. And so I spent all university trying to hash that out. Um, and finally, I, I decided that going through a spiritual crisis through all of that, I just decided to put all of it aside. And I threw away all my paintings or these are kind of big contemporary collage type things. And uh, I kind of gave up on art. And then through this spiritual crisis, I started reading, reading the church fathers um, and discovering medieval art, especially. And then through medieval art, discovering iconography and realizing that, uh, let's say the, uh, the language of medieval art, which was this beautiful, let's say mesh of relationships that, you know, all these, these references to each other, this, this almost this kind of algebra, uh, visual algebra was still alive in, in, uh, Orthodox iconography. And so that was one of the little things that kind of led me towards Orthodoxy. Also, also reading the church fathers and reading some of the modern theologians like Vladimir Lossky, um, is what finally led me to uh, Orthodoxy. Right. So it's interesting that, like a number of people I've met um, in the Eastern Church, particularly, it's the uh, visible manifestation of the faith which attracts attracted you. Um, so, how long ago was it then that you um, became Orthodox? Yeah, I started attending an Orthodox church in two thousand and one, I think. Okay. And then I finally was uh, received into the church in two thousand three. So I guess that yeah, it's been a while ago now. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. And so, yeah. And then for a while, you know, I, I moved around. I lived in Africa for several years. And so there was a lot of things happening in my life. And it's only when I returned from Africa in 2010 that I started taking icon carving seriously. Um, I had done a little bit, some of it before leaving for Africa in 2003 already. I had done some icon carving, but coming back in 2010, I started taking it seriously. I got a uh, little order from my bishop, which was kind of like a blessing of his too, to, to kind of encourage me to do this. And and there you go. And so I just started carving icons and, and right. I haven't stopped since. So now tell us about how you learned and a little more detail about where you gained these skills. Well, when I was a catechumen, was it in, in 2000, around 2001, 2002, I really desperately wanted to paint icons because I felt like I'd found you know, not just a solution to my spiritual crisis, but also a solution to my artistic problem, which was the problem of contemporary art. And so having discovered iconography, it just, it just connected everything together in terms of the aesthetics and the visual language, but also the, the, the fact that it's anchored in a community and anchored in the life of people. All of that just was amazing. So the problem was that at that time, there were very few icon teachers available. I think it's much, 
icon painting teachers. I think it's, it's better now, but at that time I just couldn't find a teacher. And so I was just boiling inside. I just wanted to paint icons, but I knew that I couldn't do it on my own because my contemporary art training would not permit me to start painting, you know, in the very technical way that iconography necessitates. Um, and so just in this boiling state, at some point, my parents, they cut down a tree in their yard. It was a linden tree. And they said, oh, we hear, Jonathan, that this wood is good for carving. Would you like some pieces and just kind of play around with it? So I thought, yeah, right away I had this idea. I'm going to make a cross, like a blessing cross with a crucifix on it. <clears throat> so they gave me this piece of wood and uh, I had no tools. I had an exacto ex knives, pretty much. And I carved the entire cross with exacto knives. Uh, it's a horrible, it was quite horrible. I still keep it as a testimony to my shame until today. Um, but I, I, I showed it to the priest who was following me at the time. And he said, you know, you know keep going. You know, this, is, this is something. Uh, and then I started taking it more seriously. I, I got some, um, some tools and I carved another icon, which took about two months. And it was like the huge, it was a very complicated icon. It was Christ sitting on a throne with the glory of cherubim. And, and it was a deusis with the Mary, Mother of God and, and St. John the Foreigner on each side. The triptych that folded up. Like it was just a super complicated thing. And when I was done with it, I realized, okay, you know, oh yeah, I, this is something. I, I could really do this. I could really take this seriously. When I showed it to the priest, then he really said, yeah, you should, you should keep doing this. And so what I did is I learned iconology with um, Father Stephen Bigham, who's a, a priest here. Uh, he lives very close to my house, about 10 minutes away. Uh, but he wrote several books on iconography um, and uh, all, uh, images especially about uh, God the Father and iconography and certain iconological debates. Uh, so he knew very much about iconology. And so I studied with him the, 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 let's say, the theoretical part, the iconological part. But in terms of the practice, there was, I, I, would, I was basically self-taught. I had to kind of teach myself because looking at ancient Byzantine carvings, looking at also Western medieval carving, um, and uh, just trying to, to, let's say, get the forms right as much as possible. And then when I started doing it professionally, I, I had already had developed some skill and I reached out to some carvers. Like I reached out to Aiden Hart. I reached out to a, a Serbian caller named George Bilak. And I said, here, you know, what do you think? For example, the first time I did a miniature was for my bishop who, that was the commission that he gave me. He said, could you carve a miniature of me of a Panagia, a mother of God for his pendant? And I never made a miniature before. So I just, wrote this Serbian miniature carver, uh, George Bilak, and I asked him, would you be willing to follow me? Like, would you be willing that I send you pictures and then you can criticize my carving? And he, he accepted. And so every few hours I would send him pictures of my carving and then he, he was Serbian. So he was just, he would just hack into me. He was so ruthless. He was saying, you know, he would say, oh, she looks like she's on drugs. You know, she, mm -hmm. she, she, she was being really ruthless about, uh, you know, what I was doing, but he brought me through. Um, and so I, I've had advice and Aiden has written me quite a few times saying, you know, you shouldn't do it this way. Here's some problems with some of your work. So I've had the chance to have other icon carvers guide me. But it was difficult because I think for icon carving, we're really like, we're really the first generation. In terms of icon painting, we're dealing with second and third generation by now yeah. after Uspensky and, and Contoglu and some of the, some of the early guys. Uh, but in terms of carving, I, we're the first generation. And so I'm able now, after doing this for, you know, for a, forever, I, having hashed out the problems and worked through the issues, now when I teach someone, I can teach them more systematic ways of doing it because I've, I've worked it out on my own. Mm. That's interesting. The, most of the, the good um, artists that I know who are actually making a living from it seem to be self-taught at the moment. Uh, even in the, um, I have a friend who's a naturalistic painter called James Gillick in England, and he is the same. So uh, there, might, there might be workshops here and there, that are certainly looking for advice, but the people who are succeeding are those who seem to have a natural sense for analyzing the tradition and then uh, really uh, bringing that into their own work and establishing their own voice. Um, we should just mention, you, you talked about first generation, second, third generation. Um, that what you're referring to there is the fact that the iconographic tradition um, in painting really was re-established uh, very successfully in about the middle of the 20th century with these uh, Russian expatriates, uh, Russian expatriates 
you mentioned Aspensky, Vladimir Losky, um, and through them, and again, what they did was a very, very careful analysis of the tradition. They picked a canon of imagery, decided what was worthwhile, and analyzed it and developed um, a, a theology that was consistent with it. And for that reason, uh, that they, because they were successful and it was well thought, thought through, uh, the tradition, many people aren't even aware that that happened. They feel right. that there's this continuous line. Now, that, to me, that's a compliment. I'm not trying to undermine I'm saying, this is what you want. You want people to look at it and say, well, this obviously has just come directly from the, the line. And it's what, yeah. they were my inspiration for the work that I've tried to do in the, the Western tradition. It's just asking myself, what did they do? And what questions did they ask? Yeah, and Uspensky, you know, despite the fact that he was Russian and he obviously favored, he, he thought that, let's say, the, you know, the, the, 14th century Russia is the epitome of all art in the history of the world. Uh, he tended for his Western students, he tended to encourage them to uh, explore, you know, the Western Middle Ages and explore the, uh, the tradition of the West, which started to, let's say, in terms of iconography, started to break down at the Renaissance. And I think, and Aiden is, it seems like that's what Aiden Hart is doing as well. He, he a lot of the tropes in his work seems to be as if, Let's say, as if the Renaissance never happened, what would Anglo-Saxon, you know, what would British art look like? So kind of going back into that tradition and, and uh, developing it in a way that is coherent to our taste today, but is also in line with, you know, the universal language of Christian art, we could call it. Yes, uh, that's, I, I, as you know, I was taught by Aidan yep. in England. We have that in common. Um, and that's certainly what, um, what he would say to us. He He's probably a little more suspicious of the Gothic, you know, so he would, he would cut it off at the Gothic, I think. But the point is the same, that, that he's looking and analysing, and then he, he has this motto, which is, uh, look twice and act once. Think mm -hmm. about what you're doing. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's go then into um, your working as an artist, but then you start to write and now you're broadcasting but tell us about the orthodox arts journal and what it's aimed at, which really is for anyone who doesn't know about it is well worth reading uh very interesting articles about art and culture and the connection between the two um so just tell us the inspiration for that and and really the <laughs> the, the uh ideas the principles that underlie the ethos of it yeah, I'm, I'm laughing a little bit because once again, you may, you may not know this or maybe you do know this, the, uh, the main inspiration for the, the format of the Orthodox Art Journal was a little website called the New Liturgical Movement uh, <laughs> and, and some of the work that you were doing at that time uh, on that website when it was really kind of voiced, you know, it was, it was, there was a time when that website was really boiling and there was a lot of yeah. things happening around it and there were, you're doing shows and you're doing all this. And so we got really excited about the idea of a, such a format. And so we, we based, you know, the notion of Orthodox art journal and the idea of having all these artists and different experts writing together to revivify Orthodox arts was kind of based on the same model as new liturgical movement. We have gone in a little bit of a different direction in the sense that we never put as, out as much content, um, maybe also because we didn't have we didn't have as much to put out, but we all we ended up focusing more on the let's say the longer form articles and and kind of explaining things and and focusing more more specifically rather than than having a lot of content with pictures. You know, I I, I know New Liturgical Movement was doing a lot of photo essays and stuff. Mm -hmm. We were trying to we we're doing a bit more long form articles, um, and so it's become I think uh, I it, it was founded by Andrew Gould and myself in two thousand and twelve. And uh, for me, it's been a really, it's been exciting for me because it has become, at least for a certain strata of Orthodox artists, it's become a place where there's an expression of this new liturgical, new sacred arts movement in, in the Orthodox church. And so we try to focus and feature different artists, uh, feature different ideas which are floating around. Um, and so... And so it's been a place where a lot of people can look to to find a uh, also think just to get excited about the possibility of what this art can offer and how it it can speak to the contemporary world. My own role in that has mostly been to talk about iconology. And so when I talked about discovering sacred art 
you know, uh, after university, it was just in this, <coughs> sorry, it was in this general spiritual crisis. And part of that included just a crisis of meaning. And so I started to explore symbolism in general in the Bible, the connection between the Bible and other traditions, and then the connection between all that and the art itself. Um, and so that led me to develop a symbolic worldview. I could, you could call it a, a, uh, a typological worldview. And that's what I was bringing mostly to my articles in the Orthodox Art Journal, which is trying to help people see how the icons, not just interpreting the icons uh, separately, but showing how the icons speak to each other. And so certain forms, let's say like the Pantocrator form will find itself in different icons and, and uh, certain tropes, you know, like a book or like, uh, or let's say the, the use of the left and the right hand in different shapes will cross, will, will create like a mesh of relationships. So this kind of intertextual discussion inside the, the world of iconography, uh, which becomes like a, like a symbolic language. And so that's mostly what I was doing uh, at the Orthodox Art Journal. And that led me slowly through a whole lot of detours to also making videos about the same type of subjects looking not only at the now then not looking only at icons but using the same way of speaking about iconography and about uh the relationship between liturgy and the bible and all these other images and then talking about even popular culture and showing mm -hmm. how this let's say the patterns of christianity are describing the patterns of reality and so you can use that worldview to look at different things and understand them yes that's interesting i i I'd like to get more into that. Um, one of the things that, first of all, I think we need a, just a little bit of explanation for people who might not know. Iconology is, oh, yeah. is the study of the content, the symbolism. I, I've got that right. Well, and iconography, which I refer, we're talking about the, the painting of icons or the tradition, the visual tradition as a whole. But within that, there is a study of the symbolism, the content, what, what it means. Um, but also this point that you're making, which Really, I've only started to appreciate more and more over the years and much more strongly recently, the interconnectivity of all things and ultimately to God. And uh, it, this is, I'm beginning to feel that, um, that so much about the decline of the faith is co in, in the West is, is connected to our loss of the, that faculty of connecting things. And... Um, so if you, if you learn the symbol, this, the symbolism you're describing, then it develops that faculty for connecting one thing to another. But then what it means is that as we go about our daily lives, we connect the beauty of the cre of creation to God. Ultimately, mm -hmm. at some point, you have to make a leap of faith to something which we cannot see and we cannot touch. And if we're not used to doing that, if we don't look at things in that way, um, it becomes a problem. Yeah. Um, and in the West, particularly in the Roman church, I, I feel, feel that we've lost that art. It, it comes down to our worship and connecting the tangible aspects of, of the manifestations of the faith, as we see in the church, for example, mm. uh, with the worship. And, and at the root of it, this is a big problem. And even for the devout, I'm not talking about the liberals who don't care about anything or distort it. I'm talking about people who are serious about the faith. You could have a church with a beautiful backdrop where all the art is right, shall we say, mm -hmm. but if we're not actually engaging with it in the course of the worship, um, never mind the devotional prayers and that sort of thing, um, then we're losing the, the most powerful influence on the development and the retention of the faith, I, I feel. No, I agree. Um, and I, I think it's the difficulty we've had in the West. And I mean, it's not just the West anymore. It's, it's the whole world is that we, mm. we've been taken up by the allure of a type of rationalism and a type of, of mechanistic way of explaining causality, you know, uh, thinking that, let's say, the modern sciences explain everything, that the, the modern sciences have a, a totalizing um, narrative on the way that we perceive the world. And so because of that, we have lost the capacity. We haven't lost it. or We have actively um, seen it as superstitious. That It's not just losing because we can't. The world, the way we engage with the world 
is by connecting things together. Human consciousness, that's how it functions. But we've actively, actively worked against that where we've, we've said that anything that, you know, like the idea that rituals are in themselves superstitious because mm-hmm. there's no mechanical causation between a ritual and the effect that you say the ritual has. It's like, if I say that, that, I've, that, that you've received grace through the sacrament of baptism, it's like you, you, can dis- you can't dissect that in a laboratory. And so because, because we, we've lost the capacity to understand how the, a different form of causality, form of causality which has more to do with being human and engaging the world through our our, our mind and through consciousness rather than just this dry mechanistic uh, descriptive uh, capacity. And so the problem is that we can't get away from from the connection. We can't. Like we can we can't get we can't stop thinking that the sun rises uh, in the morning. Even if we scientifically think that the earth turns around the sun and there's this whole complicated thing that's going on the sun still gets up in the morning. Why? Because I need to get up and my day happens when there's sunlight and then I go to bed when it's dark. And that's actually the more, most important part of why the sun gets up, gets up in the morning is because your whole life is ordered around that reality. So if you can't see that there's meaning in that, then, then you're deluding yourself. So that type of reasoning is what can bring us to seeing once again the, how the world is actually full of meaning. It's full of connection. It's funny you use that example because uh, it, nobody questions the fact that the Earth goes round the sun today. And um, now I, I just say, well, it depends where you are. The sun goes round the Earth if you're on the Earth. I mean, the sun goes round us. Um, and, it's, and is that absurd to make the, our central point of consideration us? No, it isn't because God made us to observe the universe. Yeah. So um, now the scientists may explain it in other ways, but I don't see why you you have your zero point as the sun either. I mean, yeah. why not? Why, why not some arbitrary point in the universe? Or uh, then it comes down to well, it might as well be us as the sun. Um, yeah, and, and and maybe it should be us because we're the ones talking about it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we're the ones who are looking, and we're the ones talking about it. What other point in the entire, in almost you know, like indefinite, huge universe? What other point would we take as a reference point besides the one that that is the one we actually have? Seems like that <laughs> makes sense. If we're going to take a point of view, it should be the one where that we're in. <laughs> I, I was talking to somebody once. They said, "Well, mate, what about the center of the universe, where the Big Bang occurs?" So I said, "Okay, great. Where's that?" <laughs> um, that, and for, from a scientific point of view, it is useful always to move your points of reference. So I'm not arguing with any of that. But the point you're making is that the, the a natural assumption that to argue from the point of view of where we are now here, that, that to call that superstitious, which is what the accusation is, yeah. indicates the lack of appreciation of, of the of the that our observation and our natural observation is hugely important to understanding who we are and our place in the universe. And in the end, it's not until we approach that correctly that we can really see our relationship with God in, 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 in the context of all these other relationships, in, uh, in the context of the most important one, which is to God. Yeah. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit more about that project? I, I, I just got a, was it a tweet or something that uh, talked about the, the symbolism and this new project that seems to be going on? And well, I have, a, I mean, I have a few projects going on all okay. at the same time. Tell us, I, tell I, us all about them. All then. right. Okay. Yeah. So the, the first thing, the thing that I do most, mostly is I am an icon carver. So I receive commissions and mm-hmm. uh, I carve icons for churches, for people all over the world. That, is, that has been my primary focus. But then for the past two years now, I've started giving actual conferences and doing YouTube videos on symbolism in general, which means that I talk about, I have some videos which are explicitly about Christian symbolism that I explain some aspect of the tradition. Like let's say, what is the symbolism of the tree in, in the Bible and how that fits into our understanding of the world. Uh, but then I also look at, at popular culture uh, and all that. And there, now there's a, there's a few more, there are a few more projects. The other project that I'm starting now, which is probably what you saw on Twitter, is mm. that I, 
because I have a full roster of commissions, like I, I, I can work full time on carving and, uh, and I can do that all the time. The, 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 the problem that, that, which that causes is that I don't have time to develop the craft. I'm just basically churning out my orders. I, I don't have the opportunity to develop, let's say, new things or uh, new ways of making things or, or new materials and uh, trying to, to uh, make my craft better. And so I started a, um, a project on Patreon which is a crowdfunding project to, to kind of give me time to be able to develop new techniques. So inserting colorful stones, uh, also the stone that I carve can be fired in a kiln and you can use glazes um, and, and also explore other subjects. Like I really want to get into, let's say more per religiously peripheral subjects that are not strictly sacred images, but can be, uh, you know, images of uh, ornaments or, you know, uh, fantastical beasts from medieval bestiaries, all that kind of imagery to explore that. Um, and so that's what I've recently launched is a crowdfunding project for that because I, I recently hired a, an assistant to help me with all of this. And I noticed that in hiring the assistant, I've opened up myself quite a bit of time that I can plunge into now this new, uh, this new. So, so the crowdfunding is there to kind of give me time to help pay for this assistant, obviously that I'm, that I'm hiring and people can get uh, prints and postcards and drawings from me, you know, depending at what tier that they are, uh, that they're supporting me at. Okay, where can they find this if they want to be curious? So it's, uh, it's on the pa Patreon site, which is a crowdfunding website and it's patreon.com slash Jonathan Peugeot. And that's where people can support the, uh, the art that I'm, that I'm doing. Okay, well, that's great. Now, you've talked about the new techniques there. Some people may be surprised. Uh, iconography has this reputation for being something in which everything is rigidly prescribed, um, and yet you're looking at new techniques. I know that on your site, excuse me a second, <coughs> you are um, very quick to look at new iconographers who are developing styles in painting which clearly um, is those artists are aware of what's happening in the 20th century and the 21st century. Um, could you talk about the importance of uh, developing new things in a tradition um, and, yeah. how, and how you do that without breaking out of the bounds of the tradition mm -hmm. and creating something new? Yeah well there I think there are a few things to say about that. Um, in on the Orthodox Art Journal, for example, we we featured several artists, uh, and some of the artists, to be honest, I think go too far. Some of the artists I think are doing just right, and some of the artists I find are too too rigid in terms of their things. And so it, we we feature all kinds of artists that we that we don't necessarily agree with with what they're doing, but we just want to people to be able to think for themselves on what's happening in the world of iconography. Mm -hmm. As to developing developing novelty, I always tell people that. I think novelty has no value in itself. It has neither value nor is it bad. It's, it's, it's a neutral thing. And that's difficult for people to understand because we, we live in the 20th and 20th century has been obsessed with novelty, obsessed with kind of the shock of the new and all of that. I think that we need, on the contrary, we need to see novelty as neither nor, that's not the point. The point is what is the purpose of what you're doing? You're, we're making images that are, are, to, are to be in the worship of God, in the process of the church, of worshiping God, of entering into communion with God and the saints. Um, and so we want to make things that are beautiful, that feel that they're not dead, that they're not just this, this kind of a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy, you know what I mean? So that there has to be life in it. When we do that, when we try to kind of inject life into the, uh, the iconography, it's okay to pull, you can pull threads from wherever you feel that there's something that's alive, even if it is modernism, even if, even is, even if, even if it is postmodernism. But what's important is to not do it just for the sake of creating the shock of the new or just to, to kind of titillate people with your, with your technique. Um, and so in my, per, in my personal case, what I'm doing in terms of let's say innovation is mostly taking techniques for example taking something like mosaics which is a traditional christian art and then uh the carving and trying to see how can we fuse them together to create something which feels both completely traditional but also has a fret uh, uh, like a feels like it's full of breath that it's full of life um 
and and so exploring color in different ways exploring and so my purpose isn't just to create novelty for novelty but rather to create a a sense of beauty a sense of wonder maybe uh and so that people can i know can so that people can can feel like they want they, they can see a glimpse of the beauty that god has put in this world you know just this little glimpse so so uh, to me that's how i see innovation especially yes that's i i love that uh, the way that i always think about this which, which is uh, really i think is exactly the same as you is that um it's the need that must drive it and every new generation sees things slightly differently and our job is to as the, an artist is to do the hard work which makes the 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 uh, manifestation of the faith accessible to them mm. and so in order to do that i've got to understand the the constraints what, what constitutes the tradition what doesn't wh where i can change where the soft spots are if you like and what things that i really cannot change yeah um, and work within that once i've established that work within that to um, draw people in through the through the beauty and that's the goal it's it's driven by the need yeah. of mod, the modern person as you say not the need of the artist to draw attention to himself um, it really is to uh, fulfill the purpose of art mm. and once you do that because what's what then happens is of course where do you look for these things well you look across other traditions but you're also looking at the culture outside the church yeah. um, and I see Andrew Gould for example uh, particularly he's a, an architect and I'm very interested in what, what he does because clearly he is able to design churches and then he does a lot of work uh, he's in the, the south somewhere is it, is yeah, South, south Carolina. Carolina South, south Carolina. Carolina okay beautiful uh, work that is informed the designs of his buildings houses for example informed by the, the the culture of the liturgy in fact and um could, uh, maybe you could uh, just talk a little bit this is sort of an open-ended question but how do you see what you're doing connecting with the wider culture yeah well to me i think that the conclusion that i came to let's say in terms of my own spiritual crisis and in terms of my decision to make icons was that the only solution to the cultural crisis I think is the only solution is to rediscover the grand narrative of Western culture was to rediscover the big story. And that starts with Christianity. Uh, but then there's also not just Christianity because the, the Christian middle ages inserted within their story, the whole story of the Trojan war. Uh, you know, like the, the, the people saw King Arthur as being a descendant of the Trojans. And so there's this grand narrative, which includes Alexander the Great, which includes, uh, you know, all the, of all the Greek story and Christianity, which is the, the, let's say the cornerstone of that whole story. And so I thought the only way for people, for this, for our culture to find life again is to rediscover the language, the narrative language, let's say. And so, helping people so for me if people can understand if there's a enough of a core of people who can see the beauty of the christian story and understand how it's actually a description of reality and it describes how we encounter the world and how the incarnation is the anchor of the world all of that will then start to seep into culture in other ways and so i think it's wrong i think it's wrong for people to you know christian uh movie makers to just want to make movies that that are just like you know, just like secular movies, but with a with a very thin kind of sappy Christian message. I think that if we dive into all the Christian symbolism, understand all the connections, all the beautiful connections that are there, then once we start to make movies, write novels, do the more peripheral stuff, then it will it will be soaked in that traditional worldview. I mean, that's why people love Tolkien so much. Tolkien didn't write a Christian uh, novel, but his not one of his novels one of the most christian novels of the 20th century because he was soaking in that whole language the whole symbolic language of 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 uh of western culture and so to me that's the key is is liturgical art is the first art it has to be because mm -hmm. it's it's serving the highest purpose and it's and it's done in a way which 
which brings people together. And so it, it both acts as a fulcrum of communion and it also is turned towards the infinite. And so out of that is, is the only way that out of that other culture forms can, can find their, their cohesion again. Yes, and the, someone put it to me um, in this way. They just said the liturgy is the source of its own culture. And then that is then the wellspring of the wider culture. So it, we cannot have the situation where the secular culture is the, o, is the, the only source of the culture we have in the church. That, that, I see that all too often, I'm afraid, yeah. and it's disastrous. Yeah. Uh, um, what, what then happens is you, even if the, the, the worship is um, licit, shall we say, uh, there's, a, there's a complete mismatch in form, between the what you see in the church and, and what's going on in the worship, and in the end, uh, you, you can't have the two sitting together without um, the, all these things undermining the faith. It's 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 just inevitable, and this I think is what's what's happened. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, the, the language of entertainment has completely taken over. Uh, Western Christianity yeah. and it's working in the sense that yeah people want to go to church because it's like it's going to you know you go to a concert so it's like why would I not want to go to a concert but it is it is progressively undermining the 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 underpinnings of our of of what worship and and you know what the church is to a point where more and more people are going to start to realize yeah my Christian rock band is pretty good but you know what Nirvana is a lot better that's exactly it. Why would they go to the Christian version when the, the full version of what it's trying to imitate is out there? And, yeah, and, and, it, and we're it's doing so much, this, doing it way yeah, better than you are. So much better. I, the, the, <laughs> yeah, I remember thinking that before I converted. I used to look at Christian rock as the example and just feel sorry for anybody, yeah. for these people trying to be cool who are Christian. I mean, Christianity is not about being cool. It's about it's about saying we don't even need to play that game. We play, yeah. we have a different world that is far better than this. Yeah, um, I, I couldn't agree more. The other thing that uh, was coming out in what you were saying that I, has occurred to me is that what you're giving filmmakers, for example, any any that listen to you, um, is a, a secret key to commercial success. That's right. <laughs> That's what you want because. First of all, this is the truth. And also, this symbolism is not arbitrary. It, it's not just, you know, that, that, here, let's have a cup. Let's make that represent Jesus Christ. Okay, and from now on, the more exactly. we connect the two, <laughs> that, that there's, a, there's a reality that underlies yeah. those connections that is rooted in how God made us to see things. And, mm. and so the, any filmmaker who wants to make something, like Tolkien, I mean, how many books has he sold? Um, and you can have high art, you can have popular art. Those two are not mutually exclusive because this taps into what we most deeply desire in a natural way. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, you know, and, and I, I've had by now I've had, since I started making these videos for, for about a year and a half now, I've had several, I've had, I've had, uh, authors who write novels. I've had people who are in opera. I've had uh, people who are filmmakers who have contacted me and, and said that, yeah, they, they see that this is it. Like this is the way, uh, this is the way of the future for sure. This is the way that, that we can create something that once again will feel meaningful to people uh, because, because we're, we're at a dead end, I would say. And I think most people feel it. We're, we're going towards more and more, um, flashy things we're going towards more and more kind of empty uh, sentimentalism all of this is is running its course we're running out of steam in terms of culture um and so so i think a lot of people are seeing that this is this is in a way it's the only possible future if it, there's going to be one it has to go back to the essential story it does and of course the story it is uh, that uh, all stories participate in some way that have meaning is salvation history, yeah. which, which is being lived out now. And this is why the um, scripture and, the, and typology and the, this, again, scripture itself is full of these connections between the old and the new. Um, and reading it in that way uh, develops within us um, an appreciation for all of these things and, and vice versa. Um, 
I, I want to, you talked about the, the connections you're making outside the orthodox faith of the work you're doing, which is terrific. Um, I, I'm going to just sort of move into that area now that I'm always, um, I've dealt with quite a lot of people in the Eastern Church because I'm, I'm interested in icons and I had this connection with Aiden Hart, of course. Um, and not all in the Orthodox Church are as open as you, it seems to me, um, in uh, communication with uh, Roman Catholics. Um, and um, I, I just want you to talk a little bit a, a, about that. I don't want to get, um, make this uncomfortable, but I think it's something that we need to be aware of, that the Orthodox and the Catholics, there are, we're very, very close in what we think, but there are some differences as well. Um, so maybe if you characterize those um, and then uh, describe your philosophy of engagement. Um, yeah. And before I do this, I just want to open the door a little bit and talk about Aidan, um, yeah. who is, is very open to dealing. I mean, he, uh, the story of coming across him is that uh, I wrote to him or in fact, I didn't even write to him. I wrote to an Orthodox priest whose name had been given to me 30 years ago. The letter was written, was passed to Aidan. Aidan wrote to me and invited me to come and watch him paint. Um, and he was a monk at that stage. And, uh, and I, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't mind that I wasn't Orthodox or anything like that. And he was very open. Now, <laughs> as I started to work with him, uh, I think it's fair to say that he he views he has the standard orthodox view that catholics are heretical in, in their beliefs now i'm not offended by that he um that's uh, that's reasonable and, and, and i think for him to feel that and that's why he chose orthodoxy but it didn't stop his engagement um mm -hmm. so maybe you just sort of state your view of us as as, as catholics um and <laughs> And then how you, uh, and your approach to engagement and what your hopes are <coughs> through this. I, I'm, I'm, you're extremely <coughs> generous in, in your connection. Um, and I, I noticed that you're happy to uh, deal with Catholics very positively. For example, uh, you teach for us at Pontifex University. Um, you, you offer icon courses and we endorse what you do wholeheartedly. And, you, and it's, it's wonderful, I think, that you're happy to do that. Well, I mean, I think, <laughs> I think that like Aiden, I, I think that, you know, I respect the fact that the Catholic, that the Orthodox Church is not in communion with the Catholic Church. And I, yeah. and I, I respect that reality and why that, that is. And, but I think that, you know, like I wouldn't take communion at a Catholic Church, yeah. but I, I think that it's, it's absurd. It's absurd to me, people who then would use that as an excuse not to engage because <clears throat> if we if we do want at some point for there to be actual real communion mm. then we have to engage you know yes i i hope i wish i hope that one day there can be actual real communion where the issues can actually be resolved not in a fake way not in a yeah. not in a political way but in a theological real theological discussion and real ecclesial union of course who doesn't wish that i wish that with the cops i wish that with all christians but it has to be real i'm not saying that we should just all accept everything of course not it has to be a real communion and but for that to come about the only way to do it is to to discuss and to engage and to to kind of to be able to look also at the positive aspects that are in your you know in, in catholicism you know, while criticizing the negative aspects and, and the same too, is like, here, here are some of the things I think are positive about orthodoxy. And here are some of the things that I think are negative about orthodoxy and not pretend that, you know, the Orthodox church, for example, has no problem. It's got plenty of problems. Um, so I think that's just been my way to engage with everybody, uh, not just Catholics, but other mm -hmm. types of Christians, but even atheists as well is to say, you know, like I have sympathy for some atheists because some, some Christians have silly ideas of what we mean when we say God. And so if you, ha if you don't like that, then I don't like that either. Now let's talk. So I, I think that that's just been my approach to, uh, to everybody is to say, okay, let's, let's just be honest and talk about the things that we have in common and then also talk about the things that we have in, uh, not in common. Yes, and I think that your attitude reveals a self-confidence um, that 
uh, if I believe that what I have is true, I'm not a, first of all, I'm not afraid of the differences. Uh, and so I, 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 I don't mind if somebody disagrees. Uh, that's how it ought to be. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to claim to be perfect in that. But that it, it, it really means that if I believe I have the truth, then I, have, then I want to know what those differences are, because then we can, we're exploring in this together. But um, if, what I, if I believe that what I think is true and what you think is false, that is not a, a problem. We don't need to fall out over that. We can discuss it. And I will try and convert you and you will try and convert me. And in the end, we'll see what happens. That's and, right. Now, I think that is what tolerance is. It, it's, yeah. it, it, it doesn't um, ignore differences. <clears throat> it, it, it doesn't mind them. And it seeks to re reveal them. Yeah. Um, and um, as well as the similarities. And I think so much of the intolerance that we see um, today, I think t intolerance, for example, is compatible with relativism. It, it's what it is. is it's, it finds disagreement so um, uncomfortable that it tries to pretend that there isn't any difference. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, and we, that, that just is untenable. And in the end, mm -hmm. you, there, everybody has fundamental truths which they hold, whether they believe it or not. And if they're intolerant, then they will not put up with, with differences. And that's what yeah. we see. Uh, no, I remember I, yeah. well, my, the best example I have in my mind of that is one day I was, uh, I was in Taizé, actually, in France. This was a long, long time ago. <clears throat> and I met with someone, I think it was Catholic. He could have been Orthodox. It wouldn't have made a difference. But he was saying, we all need to come together. Christians, we all need to come together. We're all together. And, and uh and, uh, you know, Protestants, Catholics, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And then I looked at him and I said, you know, Protestants think that when you pray to the Virgin Mary, you're praying to the devil. And so how do you deal with that? And he's like, well, well, you know, they'll just have to accept that we pray to the Virgin Mary. It's like, <laughs> okay, well then no, then no, we're not going to come yes. together. Like it's not going to happen. You know, yeah. let's be honest and say that we don't, we think that some of the, your practices are not right or that their practices are not right. And now let's talk about it. But to just say, oh, no, we should all love each other and come together. It's like, uh, that's, not, that's, that's not that easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, of course, one of the great um, places where people can come together, at least can uh, put their guards down somewhat, is in the, the world of art and culture. I, I think this really does allow for the, these um, meeting points to occur constructively, if we want, if we want them to. Um, it doesn't mean that we're hiding what you've just described. I, I agree with you completely that it's very important to be aware of the differences and to face them because otherwise they won't be resolved. Yeah. And that they're going to emerge at some point anyway. But what, one of those places, because of beauty in art, it, it, it changes us, it transforms mm -hmm. us, and uh, we become different people as we come into the discussion as a result of this, I think. Yeah, I agree. And I found I've been really surprised uh, in the recent few months. For example, you know, I left the Baptist churches here in Quebec now, you know, in 2003. So <clears throat> and I had in a way I didn't do it on purpose, but obviously it burned some bridges. And, you know, I kind of lost contact with a lot of those people uh, coming into orthodoxy. And now just recently, they've come back to me and asked me to come and engage with them. And so I've done twi two, two events already. And on Monday, I'm doing a third event where I'm going to go to this Baptist event and we're going to talk about symbolism, talk about imagery and, and, you know, they'll, they'll give their position. I'll give my position. And so I've been really excited that it's not, it's not as touchy as the theological, as the theological stuff, like you said, it, because we're talking about imagery, we're talking about beauty, we're talking about, um, you know, the place of, of, uh, of, of beauty in the liturgy, all of this. It's uh, I, like you said, it's less, it touches less sensitive nerves, let's say. And so, so it's been interesting to do that. And, and I think that, that the discussion has been very positive until now. Uh, could you tell me a little bit more about their reaction to the iconography? So, um, for example, what, what drives their interest? Do, do they allow imagery in their own churches? Um, no. So, no. No. So no. When, when you come and talk to them, yeah. Are they beginning to doubt this, or is it just, uh, or are they just putting that aside because they're interested in the the beauty of what you produce? Well, I think there's a few things. I 
I, I it's hard to tell to speak for other people, but I, yes. I, I yes. get the sense that there people are realizing the the kind of the bankruptcy of of where it's all headed, where the rock concert church is headed. Mm. And and I think that especially the younger people, you know, people who are in their twenties, uh some people are totally into it, but there's quite a few of the intellectuals, at least, they realize that this is not viable. And they're also realizing that what is it to be Christian then if we're just like everybody else in, in terms of what we're doing? And so the question is then, if we're going to go back to a more formal Christianity, how do we do it? How do we explore that? How do we do it? And, and they don't know. And so the uh, some of the people that I had known when I was younger and, and some of the pastors, they started to watch my YouTube channel and they saw that half, about half of the people watching my videos are atheists or kind of agnostics in, pro, in process. And uh, if you read my comment section, you'll see there's constant comments of people talking about how, you know, through this way of, talk, of speaking of the faith, through symbolism, through connecting imagery together, helping helping it understand the way that we live our lives uh, has brought them back to Christianity, brought them back to the church. People are, are going to, uh, to you mostly Orthodox and Catholic churches. Um, and so I think they saw it as, okay, so here's an evangelical, like evangelization tool that we hadn't thought about. Um, but then the discussion ended up veering back into the Bible itself and, and giving a new value to the Bible stories that a lot of the more, let's say, fundamentalist type Protestants had never seen, which is the interconnectedness of the story, mm. the, the, the total interconnectedness of the story and, and how it not only interconnects within the text, but that it's basically uh, talking about our spiritual life and talking about how the church comes together and how the world exists basically. Um, and so that, and so that, I think they, there was a surprise. People were surprised um, about that. Uh, and so I had a lot of questions about that. We ended up not talking about movies very much. Ended up talking mostly about how the structure of the story of Genesis is the same, especially the, the, the creation of the fall is the same as the temple and the tabernacle and then the mountain that Moses goes up. And then finally the story of Christ and the crucifixion on, the, on, on Golgotha, how that all just repeats the same pattern over and over. And uh, they realize, wait a minute, there's something uh, going on here. Um, and so I think that it, because people love the Bible, the evangelicals love the Bible. And so one of the problems we've had is that the, the scholar types who've been talking about the symbolism in scripture has, have usually been doing it in a, especially mo in the modern age, have been doing it almost in a relativizing or a, uh, a kind of cynical manner where, where, where they're saying, oh, this is some Mesopotamian uh, religion and, mm. and, and, and trying to undermine it. Uh, whereas most people haven't heard Christians talk about the Bible in terms of symbolism, but to do it in a way that's saying, this is amazing. Like, this is what we should follow. This is our story. This is the story, you know, and, and, and not, not do it in a way that is uh, subversive, let's say. Yes. It, 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 um, I've been struck by that. I, um, in putting together the coursework for the Master of Sacred Arts, um, I had to, we have three scripture courses so nine of the 30 credits uh, and they are uh, them they're, they're mandatory and you can do more if you wish um are actually scripture and uh i hadn't i put this together i i understood in principle the importance of this but i have to say that i, I was sitting in on those classes and uh, it has deepened my faith more than anything for a long long time um, listening to these explanations, it was Father Sebastian Carnazzo who was, was teaching it, and um, he emphasized very strongly the teachings of the Church Fathers and these connections that you're, you're describing and the typology. And then suddenly, um, I was understanding the art. I've been studying art in, for, for years, okay, and suddenly I'm, <laughs> I'm understanding it more deeply than, than I did before. Yeah. Um, and seeing how. Um, you see the same symbolism in Gothic art and in um, Eastern art. Uh, and the reason for that is that they understood the, di the Bible deeply. Yes. And one of the things that I, I, I simply don't believe that the art is just um, the presentation of the Gospels for the illiterate. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't hold water for me because um, 
people could talk to each other. I mean, they, they, were, they could communicate. They weren't in silence showing each other stained glass windows yeah. um, or icons. This yeah. is done to develop exactly this sense that you're describing, the interconnectivity, yeah. of different aspects of salvation history. Yeah, and what, but what's amazing about yeah. the traditional arts and what's amazing about iconography and the stained glass is that they are fully accessible to the illiterate. There is a simplicity to the image which makes them immediately accessible to the most common person. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, within the same images, there's a language, a kind of symbolic algebra, which reaches to the highest understanding you could fathom. And so the art actually is grounded in the most immediate you know, image of something, you look at it, you say, well, you know, that's the enunciation. And, and, and any illiterate person can understand it. But then seeing the, the, how the tropes and the structures connect to each other, then you, you, can un, you can understand the mysteries of the universe by looking at it. Yes. Yeah. And that's not an exaggeration. It's, it's no. it, the mysteries of the universe is literally what it is talking about. There is a yeah. mystery there, which we cannot understand except by revelation. And, and mm. Um, and it is exciting, I think, suddenly to see it in, in this way. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I, I think that's a great place to, to stop. I just want to wish you well in all that you're doing. It's terrific. Um, so if people want to come and listen to you and find you, you, you we mentioned one site. What, what, what else should they okay, be so aware of? So that, that I'm, I'm, on, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. But uh, people can find me on YouTube at uh, just Jonathan Peugeot on YouTube or The Symbolic World, which is uh, my, my YouTube, um, the, my, my YouTube pr channel is called The Symbolic World. I also have a website called thesymbolicworld.com where all my talks, all my podcasts, all of that is kind of concentrated on that website. Um, I also have my website, which is Peugeot Carvings. That's my carving website where people can see my carvings. And again, like I said, on Patreon, uh, people can find me there if they want to encourage my, uh, my artistic practice. So yeah, so I'm, do, I'm dabbling all over the place, but uh, yeah, we have to, right? Oh yes. Now, I, and I assume that you will accept commissions from all people. Yes, of course, of yes. course. <laughs> oh, and the other thing too that's yeah. important is that I also teach icon carving. Uh, yes. And then, like you said, People can find that on the Hexameron website, hexameron.org. And I'm also teaching in collaboration with Pontifex if people want to do it for credit. So that's been a, it's been a fun, uh, a fun collaboration. Yes, we're very, very excited about that, I, I must say. Well, Jonathan, it's been terrific to talk to you. And uh, I hope we find a chance to do it again at some point. Of course. In the and thanks yeah. for all you're doing, David, for the liturgical arts. We really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Good to talk to you. All right. You've been listening to the Way of Beauty podcast, conversations on Catholic faith and culture. For more information, go to thewayofbeauty.org. And if you want to buy the book, go to amazon.com.